Hey, good afternoon. I hope uh, I hope everything is well. It's been quite a while since uh, we've we've been here in the study of Ephesians, so I want to say welcome back. Uh, we have just been offline for it seems like forever, but it's certainly good to get back to uh, studying God's word and letting Him speak to us in the kind of world we're living in now. We need to hear more and more from Him. Listen, we're returning to chapter four. And as I've noted before, this is this is about how we walk out the faith. I mean, that's the term that turns to this chapter, the idea of how we walk. It's really, it's like where the rubber meets the road. How the, the spiritual and theological rubber that we've been exposed to in the first three chapters then meets the road of life itself. So this is really a faith uh, meant to be lived, not just thought or not just believed, uh, in fact, truly, we can't really think rightly about it until we're living it out as well. So, so that's what we're returning to here in this fourth chapter. And I just want to, by way of review, remind you that, you know, Paul, at the beginning of the fourth chapter, uh, starts with unity or brings unity into focus, the necessity, the importance of it. And he begins with the quality of our relating to one another that preserves this unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And so he mentions five virtues or qualities of character that foster and preserve the unity. So it really gets, immediately kind of gets down into this issue of, you know, what kind of life do we live? Well, we, we live a life that is, quali you know, that is qualified by um, humility, for example, and gentleness. He talks about a, a life of patience, uh, talks about bearing with one another. That's, uh, that's the idea of uh, steadfastly continuing with one another, uh, even in spite of some things that may not uh, be the best way uh, that we would like to see. Uh, it's so it contains the idea of forgiveness, right? And finally, he mentions love. You know, this is a way of life. And if you walk in this way of life, the, these are the virtues that will support you know, keeping the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So he's been there. Now, he then starts making some remarkable claims and very illuminating claims about who we are, uh, about what we are, uh, what, 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 we, what we possess, and the expectations um, of what Christ has for us or God has for us. For example, we are to grow up and always into him. This is what verse, uh, with the latter part, well, Moving toward verse uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, talks about that we are to grow up and always into him. That is Christ. Verse 13, I think, puts it out just very directly. We are to become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You know, this is the expectation. This is the promise um, that, you know, this faith has for us. Uh, the expectation is that what Christ was, we shall be. And what Christ is, even now, we shall be. That's just absolutely amazing. This is a focus on, he, he really brings us back to, this is your identity, right? And this how your identity will eventually be fully expressed, and he expects it to be fully expressed in our lives. It's really remarkable. I will have to come back to that issue of identity again. But continuing now in chapter 4, at the, moving from verse 16 into a different kind of section, of, a beginning in verse 17, Paul turns to this always, right? We're to grow up in always. What are the always? What are the ways of Christ that he is saying he's expecting us to live into and to walk out? And what follows is a series of contrasts in ways of living. Clinton Arnold coins the terms, and I think it's appropriate here, uh, that Paul's now addressing the mindsets and the lifestyles of two different groups of people. And he's using, he's bringing some sharp contrasts uh, to the surface and helping us in through the contrast to really see that that we have to leave one lifestyle and move into another lifestyle. What does that look like? What do the ways of Christ look like? And many times the ways of Christ will be seen as over against 
the ways of this world. And I will say, we certainly need these transformative ways to be manifest in our world today. So, so it begins really in verse 17, it's very interesting. He begins with the third of three critiques on the condition of the Gentile. He used the term the Gentiles. He's really referring to, to those who are outside of Christ. And, and what we read is just devastating spiritually. And if you go back and you can put these together in, in uh, uh, chapter two places in chapter two and this place in chapter four, it's just devastating spiritually and morally speaking. So listen to how Paul describes um, this condition uh, in verses 17 to 19. I'm going to read from the NIV. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That is a very ugly, ugly description. It's an ugly kind of life. And I will say, again, we just need to open our eyes. There's a lot of that ugliness in this life we find ourselves right now. It's like a diagnosis, I, I think about it, that describes the internal, for example, the internal conditions of the mind and heart that, mani that then become manifest in external deeds. It's a diagnosis of, of the life that's being manifest in this world. So Paul speaks of, really, first, lifestyle. He talks about you're not to live as the Gentiles. That's a lifestyle. That which is visible, okay, first. And then he begins to refer to the mindset, their thinking. That which is only visible to us in both the lifestyle and maybe they might say it in an utterance in their speech, but that kind of mindset is totally open to God. And that mindset produces this kind of lifestyle. Uh, and so Paul is addressing both the internal and the external here. And first he addresses the futility of their thinking. And there's, <clears throat> he may be addressing this first to make a point of, of this as being somewhat causative. This, it is the mindset, the futility of their thinking, which manifests itself in the lifestyle. Uh, but just, he talks about they have futility in their thinking. Um, and, and, and I would say, basically, Paul's saying they're living out of their thinking. This is the way they find their way through life. It's in their mind. And really, in a sense, it's not in the spirit, okay? The mind is a wonderful gift of God, but there's a kind of order that we should have. Spirit is supposed to inform mind, which is then to inform actions and deeds. It's the kind of thing we think of here. So it's a wonderful gift, but the order has been reversed. And, you know, it's the mind for the Gentiles, their thoughts, their opinions, their values, their mindset, which determines, um, in many ways, their actions, though it's not entirely true, and we'll come back to that. And this mindset is marked by, he says, futility. It's meaningless. It, it sounds like the book of Ecclesiastes. Know, that it's a futile, it's, a, it's meaningless, it's like striving after wind. And so Arnold, in his commentary, quotes, he begins by saying that they live their lives on the basis of meaningless views and perspectives. The term translated as meaningless, he notes, is, you know, used extensively in Ecclesiastes, which is one of the books of wisdom uh, in the Old Testament, to characterize a life that is not lived on the basis of the fear of God, that is critical. God is not in their perspective. So life is then vain and futile, without purpose, unless it is ordered around God and his purposes. This is what their mindsets are like. Arnold expands, he, it, really that word translated mind, he talks about here is not merely thinking or reasoning. He says here the word refers to 
to more than just the ability to reason. It refers to the capacity to think, plan, and make moral judgments and lifestyle choices. That's what the mind here is doing. So they're living out this meaninglessness. It's, and it's really sad when you think about it, driven by what they think is correct. Now Paul then describes the effect on the mind, uh, of the mindset upon the inner world of the inner man of the heart. As mentioned back in Ephesians 2, Paul talks about, you know, praying that, that uh, about your inner man, your inner person, right? So he, here Paul now begins talking about the effect of the mindset uh, upon this inner world of the inner man of the heart. But the mindset described is, is one of, well, I, I'm, let me just skip that for a minute. He says, he says in verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. That's just a devastating sentence. Just devastating. So let's just kind of break it out. He says that they are darkened. Darkened in their understanding. That is their, their light, their mindset, their understanding. Their light within is darkness. And, you know, understanding is the light of the mind that perceives the truths or, or the realities of life itself. It gives perspective, you know, on, on what we sh should be doing or what we think we ought to be doing. Uh, and, and ironically, there's, not ironically, there's a, Arnold quotes from the Targums, he gives a, pers you know, kind of a, a way of looking at this idea of this darkness. He quotes from a commentary on Jan Daniel chapter 2, this verse 4, <coughs> excuse me, and he writes that here the, the writer says the spirit of anger ensnares him in uh, the, a person in the, in the nets of deceit, blinds his eye literally, darkens his understanding, exact same phrase here, darkens his understanding by means of a lie and provides him with its own peculiar perspective. Man, you talk, this is the idea, you're really lost. You think, you know, you're looking at a map, you think it's going to get you to a certain place. It's, it's not related to what's really real. And you're in this dark. That's the effect. They're darkened in their understanding. And their major problem is that they are separated from the life of God. That's why they're darkened in their understanding. Why do the Gentiles rely upon their minds in these mindsets? Because they're separated from the life of God. And the life of God here refers to, I'm it's a lot of things it can refer to. But listen, in our context, it certainly refers to um, the life of God that is imparted to us. We, we are followers of Christ and we've received the life of God. The life of God refers also to, you know, to the idea that the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit within. He is the illuminator. He is, he is the light. And so their orientation and lifestyle are not ordered around the revealed will of the one true God and life apart from the one God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is, again, ultimately meaningless. They need the light that uh, only God can provide, that the life of God gives. Well, from this comes the ignorance that is in them, and there's a relationship between being, you know, the, the darkness of their mind and the separation from the life of God, the illumination of God, well, clearly the ignorance is logically what is produced. Now, uh, ignorance is kind of that which you need to know, but you don't know. But this not knowing in the life of the Gentile is a different kind of not knowing than simply not having the information. Ignorance is manifest they're ignorant in the presence of the knowledge and wisdom of God that people won't receive. That's, I mean, for example, in the midst of creation, Paul talks about in the first chapter of Romans, chapter one, he says, you know, the truth is there, the knowledge is there, but they don't receive it. You know, creation could inform them about God, but they don't receive it. Instead, they reject it. 
they repress it, they suppress it. So there is ignorance, but an ignorance comes from the way one relates toward truth and God. So there's culpability, but nonetheless, it's, it's immense ignorance. It's a tragedy. This produces, of course, even worse, the hardening of their hearts. The hardness of their hearts. And again, boy, we could preach on this one for a while, couldn't we? So, you know, um, all these, these things that they do, this, uh, all this darkness uh, and their reactions to the darkness affect their heart. Hardening, this hardening is taken from, this word hardening, taken from a word that could be translated callous or from the root word of callous. The idea that is that we get hard. We, um, we develop these calluses over time uh, that uh, put us even into a worse state than before. And so here he's describing the inner world of a person who is separated from the life of God as meaningless thinking, futile thinking that leads to really nowhere good. It is a, a dark world that does not see the light of God. That is, of course, it's ignorant, but it's culpably ignorant, responsible for its ignorance of spiritual and moral perspectives. And then it becomes callous, hard, and insensitive. Callous, hard, and insensitive. We were, we've been trying to find some decent things to watch, and I question whether we have, but we, uh, we, we, we use some Netflix to, uh, that has a, uh, a show of about a man that, quite frankly, I'll be honest, this guy is hardcore. He is hard tack. He is hard bark. But you see the, the effect of it in his own personal life, but the life of his family, you know, this hardness of heart. Let me say, you don't, we don't need hard hearts. We need hearts that are sensitive um, as well as strong. So Paul now, he's going to move from the mindset to the lifestyle. After this devastating critique, from the mindset to the lifestyle of the Gentile. And verse 19 says, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. Now, again, this is the things that they do in reaction to the this mindset that had been expressed before. You know, so they lose the sensitivity. And so they give themselves over to sensuality. It's kind of an interesting, it's a just a convenient English way of translating the sentence which is actually helpful. Think about it. When you lose sensitivity, you lose feeling. And that's what happens when you're really callous. You know, it says the eye, you have an insensitivity to pain. You become dead to feeling. And that would include, here he's talking about in the sense of morally and spiritually and relationally. Now we are designed to have emotions that relate and reflect both thoughts and deeds. So for example, conscience is both a kind of reasoning attended with feelings of warning, for example, of guilt or shame or internal pride in a positive sense of doing the right thing. Thoughts and perspectives come with emotional resonances as well. So spiritually, this is a kind of deadness, an insensitivity, first of God into spiritual things and to and moral deadness to conscience, for example, right? They has this insensitivity. By now, now being devoid, though, of these feelings, which we are designed to have, then folks begin to seek feelings, it seems to me, to be replaced, that they seek this sensuality. And pleasure begins to replace um, the feelings they've lost. And people seeking to, uh, to feel indulge in every kind of impurity. Now, you think about folks that, whether it be certainly impurity is, is referring to sexuality here, but it's more than that. I mean, you're, you're, you're just seeking ways to feel alive and to be alive. And every kind of self-indulgence, sexual or otherwise, by the way, this, this word uh, impurity uh, it also relates to witchcraft and idolatry and false religion, that type of thing, right? You know, this is a way of, I'm not feeling over here. I need to feel. I need to feel alive type of thing. And finally, with these darkened minds and this futile, empty, meaningless thinking, 
unconnected with God's purposes or will, then greed comes as a logical purpose of life, doesn't it? Uh, the acquisition of things to fill what you don't have, right? Pascal had a great quote about this, that we seek from things absent the things we can't get from the things present, we begin to try to fill up the emptiness of our life with things that can never fill the emptiness because that emptiness is meant to be filled with, with the infinite God, with the Holy Spirit type of thing. So that's the sense of this terrible condition. It's, it's, Ephesians is remarkable in taking about nine verses uh, or eight verses, nine verses, eight verses, um, and really describing the human condition uh, as devastating. And again, I, I, I may come back to that. Let me, let me step away from that. This is a devastating description of a way of life. And really, and it was pointed out in a variety of commentaries, point, it's, and its core is the self. Self as the ultimate horizon or purpose, the ultimate value, and people live that out. They live it out. And you got on the surface, can be, we can be very amenable and very kind and very gracious when push comes to shove and we have to choose between ourself and whatever else we're going to choose ourselves. That's the sense of this life of the Gentile. And he says, so Paul takes these three verses and describes exactly what is not to be characteristic of us, what should not be. And this is the world from which the Ephesians have emerged, the world that they left to come into the kingdom of God. And vestiges, let's be honest, I mean, you just can't just shed that. I mean, you have so many years of habitual patterns, ways of thinking, ways of relating to the world, that the vestiges hold on to them. These mindsets and lifestyles still cling to these Ephesians to some degree. And so now Paul turns in verse 20 to 24. And writes of a process of being transformed, of moving from this old style of life and mindset to the new. So let me just read to you verses 20 to 24. It says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self. Now, there's that sense of identity. Right, self, put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and then it says, be made new in the attitude of your minds, and that's verse 23, and then 24 says, and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's a, that's a mouthful in three verses, my friend. Mouthful in four verses, I'm sorry. So Paul begins, first of all, again, with the way of life, just like he started before in addressing the Gentiles' way of life. Now he's addressing our way of life. This is the dominant issue of living the life of Christ in this world. And they are in a process of moving from your former way of life. And it's not just stopping some things, not doing some things. It's replacing them with new ways, new behaviors, new practices, new thinking. So when it comes to the Christian faith, it's not a bunch of just don'ts. It is a bunch of do's. We're bringing, in you, bringing people into a new life itself, that we shall see what that life looks like as we move through the text. And he describes, as he moves on in this text, the process that the Ephesians were to employ. And he just says, he says, you're going to put off your old self and you're going to put on your new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And, and the bridge between them is verse 23. The bridge between them is our mind. We need to begin to think differently. It's, it's, we're going to unpack this just a little bit. Now, interesting, he specifically, I'm going to go, he, he specifically addresses as this bridge of movement the way that they think, their mind. This is an important battle for us. He says, be made new in the attitude of your mind. So I'm going to have to come back someday and break out what attitude means. But 
be made new in the attitude of your minds. An attitude is um, it's certainly thinking, but it's deeper than thinking. It has that, again, that emotional connectedness to it, right? Uh, and here, the first thing he address, addresses is truth. Truth is critical. He talks about being taught in Christ in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Truth is mentioned two times. He says, the first thing you and I need to get into our heads, into our minds, is truth about God, truth about the world, truth about ourselves. And, and this is what before has been rejected, as I said before. That truth is now supremely revealed in Jesus Christ. He is, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is. Truth is a person. Now, to be taught in him is more than simply content, though content is important. Knowledge is important. And there are different levels. It's not just knowledge, it's understanding, right? And then understanding is also wisdom. So, But it's not simply content. And Jesus is deeply, to be, you know, be taught in Jesus, to be deeply relational and very personal. And it is this truth uh, that, that we, if we begin to let this truth renew our minds, uh, then our thoughts will not lead us into futility and corruption. So our new knowing leads to, also, we think about it, a new way of seeing, new mindsets, new perspectives that can inform our choices, our deeds, and our lifestyle. That's a sense of the bridge of the mind. But no, it is not new thinking alone. You, this is a problem that uh, a lot of us have. We focus on thinking or beliefs or knowledge, and it's only part of, of the process, a part of the transformation. We cannot merely think our way to becoming like Christ. We are to walk in his ways, to live his style of life. Thinking leads to a certain kind of living. So it's thinking and acting that combine to, in this transformative process. So, you know, this, this renewed mind will see or perceive with the mindset of Christ. And then we are to do what we see to do or understand. And Paul uses the metaphor of taking off and putting on clothing. We are to put off the old self and to put on the new self. The mind helps us recognize what those particular things are. And I thought, though I'm not totally committed uh, to the way the Passion Translation writes, I thought it would be helpful just to listen to this way of translating verses 22 through 24. He says, Paul, and Paul writing here, translated by the Passion, says, And he has taught you to let go of the lifestyle of the ancient man, the old self, that identity, right? Life, right? Which is corrupted by sinful and deceitful desires that spring from delusions. I guess that deals with this darkness. He says, now it's time to be made new in every revelation that's been given to you. Now here, it's interesting. Here in the NIV, it focuses on the mind, but here he talks about every revelation that the mind needs to receive the truth as revealed to us. Now it's time to do that and to be transformed as you embrace the, the glorious Christ within as your new life and live in union with him. For God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness and you now belong to him in the realm of true holiness. Very interesting way of reading it. Uh, and, and I just think you needed to hear that. So how, how do we translate, you know, this metaphor of changing clothing, of putting off and putting on into just in a practical way of understanding? And I want to share two perspectives that, that I think help us understand the transformational process of what Paul is talking about. And the first comes from a book entitled What Your Body Knows About God. Uh, it's a great, great book. But he, Rob Moll is citing research into our body, into our brain, that is helps us understand, you know, even things like we're looking at here in this, in the scripture. He he talks about research on how we learn, how in the 
not just cognitively, but also socially and relationally. And the research found that, that our brains are wired to mimic to mimic others, to mimic people. We look at them and mimic them. Then we have these things called mirror neurons that literally mirror what we see in others. And our brain mirrors, and then what happens is, for example, our face follows. I mean, if we see someone smile, there, the neurons mimic the smile in the brain, these mirror, mirror neurons, and then we start to smile. Or we start to frown, depending on what we see. And with this mimicking comes feelings. In fact, they say this is the way we begin to feel what other people feel. It's the way we empathize and sympathize with people. Uh, we imitate what we see, and in the imitation, we begin to feel what's going on. So in imitation, we're putting on a way, really interestingly enough, the other thing is we imitate actions um, that, we, that we see mirrored in the lives of others as well. It's the way we learn. So in the imitation, we're putting on a way of living that we see in another person. So putting on fills the vacuum of letting go and putting off. That is, we're stopping doing something, but we're replacing it with this, right? Uh, replacing it with this. Uh, and, and in another way, and that's another way of living. And, it's, and it really, in a sense, it's kind of like undressing and dressing in a new way. So practices and habits replace other practices and habits. That's the sense of, I'm going to put that off, I'm going to put this on. Now, we have an advantage because we have been given a new identity. It's our truest identity that through the work of the Spirit is, is emerging consistently, or supposed to be emerging consistently in our lives, and it's the identity of Jesus Christ imparted by the work of the Holy Spirit that's been mentioned throughout the book. And so we're not trapped in the futility of our minds. Our spirits are illuminated by the Holy Spirit who releases also a strengthening and a transforming grace that we activate by faith. And finally, as our part of the transformation process, I think uh, something by John Ortberg in his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, was very helpful. And basically he says, listen, we need to quit trying and start training. We need to learn to quit trying and start training. That is, as with anything that you do, you don't begin as an expert. You have to train and practice to develop the skill for anything. And he says that's true of living the Christian life. It's true of the virtues that are going to be, be shared with us. And he writes, unless you arrange your life around certain practices that will enable you to do what you cannot do now by willpower alone. He says, you must arrange your life around certain practices that will enable you to do what you cannot do now by willpower alone. And when it comes to running a marathon, you must train, not merely try. And that's, that's the sense of this. This is the realistic part of our contribution, but it helps us be realistic because let's be honest. I'm going to go out and if I'm going to shoot some baskets, if I just step down on the court the first time, I'm not going to hit a basket like Michael Jordan did. But I have to train and have to practice over time. The skill develops, right? Part of it is I see what he does. And then I begin to, he becomes a mirror for me. And then I'm trying to bring, manifest that mirror into my own actions. And so I think about, you know, these terms, practice and train, go with the metaphor of changing clothes. We must begin our day with intentionally putting on Christ. Every day we get dressed to come out into the world and we walk through our day imitating him as best we can. And you do it, notice that, every day. Every day. When we fail, when we fall, we get back up and do it again and again and again. And by the transforming grace of the Holy Spirit, we begin to acquire what we couldn't in and of ourselves, do we begin to acquire the life of Christ? We begin to imitate the life of Christ. Let me close with this. Uh, there's a movie entitled Family Man, where Nicolas Cage, well, he plays a, um, uh, it's, it's longer than that, but listen, Nicolas Cage plays a middle-class man with a family who you know, goes to the mall one day with the kids and the wife, and he goes on his own way, goes, steps into a men's store. And he sees this suit he really likes. 
So he puts it on and he looks in the mirror and he stands and he moves and he turns and he really, really likes what he sees. His wife walks into the store about that time with the kids and she really likes it too. And this is what Nicholas Cage says to his wife. It's an unbelievable thing. Wearing this suit actually makes me feel like a better person. Wasn't that interesting? <laughs> That's the perfect line for our call from this text to put on our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what. Wearing the suit of the Lord Jesus Christ not only makes us feel like a better person. My friends, we will be a better person. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word of yours, and we ask you, Lord, to help direct us and and walking this transformative process out and make you proud and who we are and what we do. We ask it in Jesus' name. God bless. Amen. Amen. God bless. We'll see you soon.